Hello and welcome to the Majlis, ready for your Pride of Liberty's current affairs podcast focusing on Central Asia. I am Mohammed Tahir, the host of the Majlis podcast and ready for your Pride of Liberty's media manager for South and Central Asia here in Washington, D.C. March 8th, International Women's Day coming up this weekend. And as always, there are numerous activities are planned to highlight the achievements and challenges of women in today's society. Women's March or similar gatherings have been traditionally some of such activities in Central Asia, but this year it won't happen, at least in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, the two countries known for it is relatively progressive reputation in the region. However, over the past year, we have seen a number of high profile in according to some controversial events that brought lots of attention to women's plight. On this occasion, we decided to check back to see how is the region doing on this matter? What are some of the ongoing challenges? Have the events of the last year led to any changes? To discuss all these, I'm joined by Kamila Sultanova, a keynote speaker, gender equality activist and entrepreneur at the Connect Uz. She's originally from Uzbekistan. Karligash Kobatova, the editor of Oyat MS, a feminist project and website run out of Kazakhstan. Bruce Panier, the editor of Arafiaril Central Asia blog, Kishlok Uwazi. Thank you, colleagues, for joining us today. So let's start with you, Karligash. So the mm-hmm. decision by the authorities, what was that about and what, what they want? Actually, the, as far as I know, because I am in contact with the people who are organizing the march, mm-hmm. it will take place on oh. the 8th of March by the Tsum. It's like a central store from the Soviet times. Mm. So it was traditionally started there a few years ago. And mm. several feminist initiatives are uniting to conduct that march. Mm. And um, because in Bishkek it got canceled, they just learned about it. They were wondering to invite the women and colleagues and whoever wants to join the march to join them in Almaty Uh this year because Kazakhstani activists went to Bishkek last year. Mm, They look fired up. Uh, Bruce, uh, so what was this uh, the discussion about that they are canceling this event or cancel this event because of coronavirus or something like that? You know, that's what they said. And this is one of those where you really have a hard time arguing. I mean, I, I really have I'm skeptical that that was the reason. But in the meantime, certainly everyone is watching the outbreak of this coronavirus around the world. It just happened to be an unfortunate coincidence. You know, if you're on the side of the marchers that all of a sudden the authorities had this reason why they said but, that they didn't want people out there marching. But, uh, you know, in Kazakhstan's case, they've just seen a lot of protests. So they, they didn't want to see a protest anyway. Any any kind of march, anything that would get the public out into the street. But, but um, so they were looking for a reason. Bruce, it looks like, according to the uh, Karligash's information, it's taking place this year in Kazakhstan. So, yeah, I, I know, but I, I, does that actually sanction? Was there permission for that? Or I, I, my, it was my impression the marchers were just going to go ahead and do it anyway. I think that's that's what's going to happen. But they are prepared to be arrested, even though they they announced that it's a peaceful march. It's not a protest. It's just uh, to bring attention to women's rights. So it looks like this is one of those events that the organizers will do it anyway, even if authorities doesn't want them to. to, to uh, yes, I think so. Okay, okay, that that's interesting. Kamila, what's happening in Uzbekistan about this day? About what? About Women's Day. Ah, Women's Day. Yeah. Um. I I haven't seen so much going on if there's going to be like big events, but Mm -hmm. usually there are some um, celebrations. Last year, there was something about Uzbek Ayol. Um, I think we had a chat at the time, but uh, we've been been really crazy about Global uh, Fund for Women Mm -hmm. event Mm -hmm. where in Dubai. So there was Global Women's uh, Forum that uh, was visited and represented by Saida Mirziaeva, right. the daughter of uh, Shavkat Mirziaev, the president of Uzbekistan. So she was given a very compelling speech mm. where she lifted the status of women in Uzbekistan, saying that empowering women, you empower a nation. Right. And we really needed that kind of fresh breath. And she mentioned also what have been the the new laws that supports the gender equality. Mm. So during the last three years, so last year they have adopted three laws. First one was protection of reproductive mm. rights. Mm. Second law, guarantee for equal rights and opportunities. Mm. And third one, protection of women from oppression and violence. And at the moment, all friends of mine, um, we are the, representing the Uzbek diaspora abroad. Mm. We are demanding and we're trying to raise initiatives and trying to increase the voices mm. of making sure that these laws are now put into action, that they are strengthened in practice at the moment. It is 
too early to say, but and also I, I've noticed an increase of great stories of violence um, being reported. And of course, none of none of them are really good to hear. You don't want to hear that, but but it's good that it comes out. We have a number of women bloggers who are, are now blogging on Telegram, mm. and, and and this is really great. What I've been talking to you, our previous Central Asian mm. Focus uh, podcast, that we need to be more out there sharing our stories, yeah. regardless yeah. if it's the eighth of March or not. Yeah, definitely, and we are very much focused on that. So, Kamila, President daughter joining the big gathering in United. Arab Emirates or some of the laws are passed. These are good positive stuffs that coming out of Uzbekistan. Other than that, the type of the NGO-led activities, not the government sponsored, but the NGO-led activities, what kind of activism are you seeing in Uzbekistan in recent days? How much of these renewed interest in women's rights on official level is kind of translating onto street level activism? Truth to be told, we still have an issue registering NGOs in Uzbekistan. Mm. The mm. true NGOs, not the gong <laughs> mm, yeah. And um, this has been written really well by our really one of the prominent journalists, Nikita Makarenka. Mm. We also have uh, had a great um, scholar on inclusion. His name is Dilmurat Yusupov. He has his own Telegram channel connecting inclusion uh, activists and NGO representatives. Right, right. Terrific. Bruce, about the other two Central Asian countries, I think in Turkmenistan, nothing really exciting happens there in terms of the Women's Day activities. I imagine one thing to take place which has been the annual tradition there that they will distribute two, three dollars check to women. And then there was activities taking place this year in Tajikistan in terms of the women's rights. Is there anything that you heard that they are planning this year specifically on on the Women's Day? I mean, you hit it as far as Turkmenistan, they'll they'll pass out $8 to every woman or whatever they have done in the past. It's almost nothing. That's recognition. And and if the women are lucky, the president, Berdy Mukhamedov, will not sing a song or write a poem for him this year. Um, in Tajikistan, I haven't heard of any plans for them to, to do anything in particular. And, um, and of course, now there's they got the fear of the coronavirus there, too. They've been, I think people are uh, panicked enough at the moment that that's probably not their focus, mm. um, which is unfortunate because, mm. according to authorities, there is no coronavirus. But, they, you know, when, once they ordered the mosque to be closed on Fridays, mm. you know, that, that kind of, set people off. So normally it would probably be a very low-key event in Tajikistan anyway. I, I don't know if they would do much of anything now. Uh, past, you know, the president giving his, some address and, and thanking women for their contributions. Uh, but, you know, they've become much more conservative in Tajikistan oh, yeah. since, you know, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, you know, they've actually headed in the opposite direction as far as uh, gender equality and feminism. Yeah, yeah. Carly Gosh, so well, the activists are planning on doing it anyway. So what they have in, on the agenda? What they what they plan to do? I think they just want to have this peaceful march and mm. again remind about the rights of women and gender equality and the government's reaction. Yes, they are just like always they overreact mm. and they are afraid of any gatherings and the coronavirus is just an excuse. Mm. So mm. I'm not sure about the agenda, but usually they just have some like posters mm. with some slogans and you just walk and of course they are criticized. but. That's all they want, I think. Yeah. Also, to clarify that, I guess there is not an all-out ban on Women's Day activities, right? I mean, we are just talking about these marches, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, the celebrations. What I read in the news is that the celebrations... Officially sponsored celebration or any celebration? I think official or probably even maybe... I'm not sure, <laughs> actually. Bruce? But I think it's like yeah. the usual one, you know, a concert at a square with yeah. a lot of people gathering... In the kind. Uh, Bruce, what do you know about this? I mean, both in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. What really they are banning? What we should understand when they say it's banned? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, it's a little bit, I think maybe a little bit different between Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, hmm. but not so much. Like, the, you know, my understanding from talking with people that were in Kyrgyzstan was that the biggest fear, you know, until they decided they were going to shut the whole thing down, um, the biggest concern they had was that it would that it would turn into an LGBT March parade too, mm-hmm. and that was you know I talked to someone who was trying to get this thing organized, and they said that that city authorities told them they didn't want to see any rainbow flags. 
right? Um, you know, and, and to some extent, I suppose that can happen in Kazakhstan too. You know, so it, it's really weird that we did this last year. And you remember the, you know, the Kirk Choro, the morality police, yeah. as they, they, they showed up and tried to break up the rally because they were offended mm. uh, by this. And I think so that's one thing that conservative elements in both countries probably took into consideration. You know, like I said, they, they, I think authorities were looking for a reason not to let them hold these demonstrations. It just so, ha- so happened that it coincided with this the outbreak of this virus. And so they just said, OK, well, look, it, it's the virus. Uh, yeah, right. So so you can't have your your march because of the virus. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, um, they might have used coronavirus excuse to stop women's gathering this time in Bishkek or maybe in Kazakhstan. But over the past year, there have been a couple of very women focused feminist activities have taken place in Central Asia. I remember the exhibition in Tajikistan has drawn lots of attention as well as Feminale I think that was held in Kyrgyzstan similar activities took place in Kazakhstan so those events certainly draw lots of attention to the issues of gender equality in the region but the question is did those events make any difference? What were the lessons we should learn from them to keep the good fight going forward? Let's continue the discussion talking about these and many other questions very shortly. First, let me recap the debate that today on the Majlis podcast. I'm joined by Kamila Sultanova, a keynote speaker, gender equality activist and entrepreneur at the Connect Uz. She's originally from Uzbekistan. Karligash Kavatova, the editor of Oyat MS, a feminist project and website run out of Kazakhstan. Bruce Panier, the editor of RFRL Central Asia blog, Kishlak Awazi. I'm Mohamed Tahir, RFRL's media manager for South and Central Asia here in Washington, D.C., and we are discussing women's rights in their rule in Central Asian societies. So over the past year, Camila, there were a number of occasions in which issues related to women's rights hit the headlines. On this platform, I think we have had uh, four or five episodes devoted to this topic. So let's recall some of those major events first, and then I will have a couple of follow-up questions. So um, we had uh, two very young artists who created um, a, a spur of Central Asian, you know, female power through art. And I I love the art because artists show and make us understand things very clearly. So um, what's what's her name? Zera, she made a song, a video. It was her first video where she sang and she filmed herself where, you know, she was wearing a blazer, but under blazer was only a bra. And of course, that really provoked the whole nation. And she got two camps uh, for and against her. The best thing that came out of it that her father was super supportive. Right. And this is unheard of. You know, we need father supporters mm. in our societies. And um, she did get a lot of hate mails and whatever. And and then we had, I think it was Davleta. What's her name? The artist in Tajikistan. In Tajikistan. Bruce, what was her name? I, I kind of forgot now. Zilfuza. No, not Zilfuza. I'm sorry. I forgot her name. But the content was like she had an exhibition in Tajikistan, yes. in Dushanbe. So the, the artist from Tajikistan, she had drawn a mm. few paintings and, and that showed female breasts. And, mm. and that also provoked a lot of people. And, and it's again, why do something? And, and we have other artists mm. showing <laughs> nudity. Yeah. So she got hate, hate mail. She got, of course, um, criticized. You know, it's, our region is happy. And I think <laughs> to criticize, and I think Karlagash, uh, that's the reason why you have your movement, which I absolutely think is is timely and we should spread it with hashtags to all our countries because mm. we sh- share the same challenges mm-hmm. yeah Carly Gosh is telling me that uh, you know I should call her <laughs> NGO Youth Sexuality Education Project it and is actually and of course we, I promote also uh, women's rights and gender mm-hmm. equality and feminism but it's all through the prism of access of youth to sexuality education so what, because what's, what's that's this, a big problem what, what's the name is coming from Uyatimas I understand that like it's uh, Uyat is a shame shame so yeah so I think it's the same word in Kyrgyz and Yemes is like a negation so, so the so, meaning is that uh, the message is that it's not shameful to learn about your sexual and reproductive health and rights right and right. about the events from the last year oh. i also wanted to mention this gender equality festival femagora oh. that took place in almada last year uh, during four days and this year they were planning to do it to make it central asian and make it last for two months almost with events in different countries and different cities but with this coronavirus wow, I'm, I'm not sure now if how they're going to handle it but 
this why, festival why you like, say that why you say that because i think the coronavirus with all these quarantines and everything it's a big obstacle i think um, big, big like obstacle. new obstacle if, even if we uh, ignore uh, all the Are you other, saying like, are are you saying it's a big obstacle or big excuse for the authorities? Um, I think it's both. It, it's also objective obstacle, but then it can be an excuse for governments to mm. ban some events or not allow them or just develop bureaucracy to prevent them happening. But the festival is amazing because it covers so many areas like arts, health, sexuality, professional development of women, women's rights in all spheres. Mm. And so I hope this will happen. Yeah, let's see. We will uh, have our eyes on it. Uh, Bruce, let me also bring you here. So on Feminale, for example, this was a major topic of discussion, as uh, Camilla was saying, uh, as well as the exhibition in Tajikistan. Of course, such discussions have never been easy in any country. But but I guess the points were made in both of those countries, I guess. What was the outcome, if any from those events but, you know camilla hit on it at the very start of this uh, mm. of the program was that there is more reporting coming out certainly from kyrgyzstan about violence against women mm. uh, and i'm you know, i would imagine that this violence was always there but it, oh, the yes. media has actually started to report on this very unfortunate stories you know mm. women being killed by their husbands you know stalked by their husbands beaten by their husbands things like this you know that you didn't see that much of in the media uh before groups you know local feminist groups in kyrgyzstan Stana and you know the feminine exhibit and stuff started to hit there so that there is that kind of attention it, it's unfortunate that you know it, it's also tragic when you see it but like I said mm. I, I imagine this was always happening and didn't get any attention at all so at least it brings it to the front so people have to look at this and see that you know how ugly this is um, that this has been going on for a while and that these spouses or boyfriends or something have been doing this mm. with impunity and getting away with it yeah. uh, you know so it, it is starting to put the rightly the responsibility on the attacker here uh, you know the the person that's responsible for committing these kind of acts so that's that's all for all for the better i hope in the future there's less stories about this because it will happen less often uh, but uh-huh. but i understand that there is a need for this to happen right now and and i know camilla would be able would be better to talk about this but there's two other things that were going on now in uzbekistan they just had elections and and they made it a point to make sure you know that more women got into parliament it mm-hmm. wasn't a free and fair election but at least they changed the gender balance and yeah. this is also a topic that has been coming up in Kyrgyzstan again and again is that although this is provided for in the Constitution it is not honored in fact quota that of spots that are supposed to be there for women is is in fact not there hmm. Karligash, also let me take your point on the same topic. Then we have to move on to a few other points we have to discuss before I wrap up the discussion. So the type of events which have been taking place in Kazakhstan or in the neighboring countries in support of the women's rights over the past year, have they made any practical difference in improving women's rights and gender equality? I mean, do you have any concrete examples that you could share with us? Well, the problem, I think, with such events is that when you mention gender equality, quality or mm. feminism people get scared they don't understand what it's about and they don't attend attend only those who kind of understand or want to understand mm. and then it's like a bubble is created and like different worlds they don't overlap because when there was this women's march two years ago mm. there were people who were of course uh, criticizing people even now the most recent case i think about uh, sexual harassment there's mm. a young um, singer the queen and she made a post on instagram after the concert that she's been harassed by two young rappers who mm. grabbed her tried to to kiss her and they were like this is normal why are you even complaining and then she wrote a big post the next day and mm. a lot of responses appeared other women young girls sharing their stories and of course other uh, like men and other women who are like why are you bringing this up this is it's your fault as always uh, victim blaming and like you just want to hype on this topic so there are good developments but then also negative ones and like about bruce mentioned domestic violence this year uh, because of a very uh, big case about a rape in the train they made laws about sexual violence about rape maybe Stricter, maybe i i missed this uh, story what was that rape about when when did that um, take place i think it was it happened two years ago a mm. woman who was coming from a science conference she has a phd and she lives in the west of kazakhstan she was raped by two men who work on the train mm. she was raped by them oh and God. then and they only gave them like six months each the, and then, of course, their family started harassing her, and her name was like 
everywhere because the police disclosed it to the public. And then she sued them again. And I think now they, they got like five years each. And then the law was changed. And now rape was moved from like medium crime, I don't know the legal terms, to like harsh crime. And now you cannot reconciliate with the rapist and their family before going to court. Like it was always like that before. And even the police would try to convince you not to continue with your charges. Hmm. And the, the victim would suffer way more than the abuser, actually. So they changed that law. But then with the domestic violence law, they canceled the fines because they were like, well, this hurts the family budget. But it's not only official husbands who beat their, uh, their wives. It's also boyfriends, ex-boyfriends and other people who don't share the family mm-hmm. budget. So that measure was controversial and it's viewed, perceived by the society as a fallback. Like it's not a good development for that law. And so, women are less protected now. Thanks, Karl Gash. Now um, you're talking about uh, some positive and some negative changes over the past year, which might or might not be connected to the renewed activism on women's rights in Central Asia during the, during the last year. While you were talking, Karl I was also wondering whether there is anything activists could have done differently or could have approached this issue somewhat differently, which could have led you to a different outcome, perhaps a lasting outcome. I guess my question is, what are the lessons we should learn from last year and last year's activism as you are thinking of your plans and projects for, the, for this year? I think that uh, we need to all get out of our bubbles because I'm an activist, but also I'm a researcher. Mm. And my latest research was about, because I advocate for sexuality education in schools for all the children, because right now we don't have it. And I conducted several, like five uh, focus groups with parents and five focus groups with teenagers to see, to hear their fears and their desires about sexuality education, if they think they need it. And actually, there is a consensus. Both parents and youth, they want access to sexuality education. Mm. But then the problem is in gender socialization. Like parents, they raise their daughters to be very, like, very calm and you need to save. uh, Are you searching for the word of submissive? Yeah, oh, well, all kinds of this word, like submissive, you shouldn't go out at night alone or you shouldn't wear makeup. And they, some of them really believe that if you are wearing a hijab, you, nobody will harass you or rape you. So it's, again, this victim blaming. And then boys, they don't receive any messages at all. Like, just have a condom with you. Like, they receive no messages about, uh, about uh, not raping girls or women or that violence is bad so what i'm saying is that we need to uh, researchers have to uh, speak to the general public and make it in a simple way so more people would listen to facts actually not just their emotions because stereotype is that sexuality education is bad and and it corrupts innocent minds of children which is not true it makes their lives safer both boys yeah. and girls yeah but so e- e- the other the day activists and yeah they should come out and try to reach different audiences that's interesting kind of uh, prognosis i wondered what what camilla you thought about this when could the uh, this outcome have been different is there anything the the activists could have achieved by approaching this uh, issue somewhat differently I mean, why I also asking this question to you because your adopted homeland, Finland, <coughs> is the champion in the world in terms of this gender equality. Are there any any lessons that Central Asia can learn from from them to tackle this issue? Hmm. First, it starts. You know, everything starts from political participation, right? Yeah. And now we're going by the book with granting more decision makers in political chambers. Hmm. So, uh, as Bruce said, we had elections, and we have now five hakim. So mayors, hmm. like regional vilayats, so Andijan, Zidaria, Bukhara, Namangan, and Kashkadaria, even my home region, gets a female mayor, which is a great celebration. And I hope that, you know, the, the right people, the competent women are in power. But but as I joke, uh, joke about it with someone commented on Facebook said, well, is it only about the gender? I said, well, if, if there was a campaign, show me your favorite mayor, you know? If someone had to vote for the favorite mayor, there was no women before to screw it up. <laughs> so, so we need to kind of 
also make sure that you know women are also given power uh, and competencies to 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 really have the mandate to make changes so on the other hand also the the, the deputies have increased in in the parliament so in Oli Majli so I think the statistics was that they went from 24 to 48 deputies so it's it's very really good my issue is here with uh, ubiquitous internet and telegram you know the whole world is using telegram it's um, a, a huge uh, number of fake news, one. Two, the problem is with a lot of religious discussions, and, and I, I get every Friday much more greetings about that it's a Juma, mm. which is okay. I, I think it's, it's, it's okay to celebrate it, but I'm afraid that there's more mosques being built than schools. And, and three is still people are very careful how much they speak out, you know, what are the freedoms for, for activists to go out there and say, yes, Karlagash, you're right, we should get out of our bubbles. Even in Uzbekistan, you have that elite who speaks English, who has access to the Internet and, and part of global mm-hmm. processes. But then, then there's also people who have no education, but they have access to uh, Internet and they don't have the critical thinking. Mm-hmm. So I would I would start by looking at how do we educate the fake news approach, regardless where you are, what you study, what you do, and go through our mahallas because they have a lot of ways of like, you know, community communication saying that they are the people of power. You know, we as, as, as equal, equality activists, as NGOs, there's still resentment because of gender, because of age. I am myself international di- Uzbek diaspora trying to also bring all the know-how and network, but those people in the mahallas, both the, the the people who have what do you call it obru in Uzbek is the, the, uh, the reputation and the influence. Honor. Yeah. And if we talk to them and say, listen, it's not sexual education; it's reproductive health. You know, you can change the narrative because I know we even last year in 2019 in February we had this Uzbekistan 2035 forum, and we said to them, we need sex ed. They it even hurt in their ears. So and then he came to me this one 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 gentleman and said just call it reproductive health it will be more receptive he he said my two daughters yeah yeah can you imagine I was like is that easy we'll do it it's okay it's just the narrative and then he said my two daughters got married and they got early and they had severe issues because of the the reproductive um, health they had so he knows if we push it as a health there will be more buy in. Oh, yes, I agree with that. That's why I, I word it as reproductive health and safety, because mm. you have to word it like in a certain way to make it palatable yeah. for parents and the government people. Mm. Um, uh, on, on rephrasing the name of the education, yeah, sure, if, if that works, why not? But on your p- other point, Camilla, more female participation in government bodies are all good. I, I have nothing against it. But my question is how much of a difference it is making in practice to take the type of issues we are talking about today. I mean, if women participation is any indication of a progress, you can call your neighbor Turkmenistan the most progressive country in the region. But, but I'm not sure women are facing less challenges challenges in Turkmenistan than Uzbekistan or in any other Central Asian countries. My, I mean, their presence in the government alone is not a guarantee that things will change. You know, the fact that there are more females in the parliament today in Uzbekistan or in the administrative rules, is this making any, any practical or a positive difference in a day-to-day challenges of women in the society? Well, it makes it that that it's on everybody's lips. And I think that's like our, you know, gender renaissance this spring, Mm. because we have just had a BBC, I think it's like triple series BBC about Mm. Uzbek, Baburian uh, Uzbek history. Okay and the whole history of the region. So we are there. Then there is stuff going on with inclusive Uzbekistan half marathon that just happened, which has also been promoting heavily inclusion and gender equality with Ministry of Culture and Education, um, Ministry of Culture. And then uh, there is a lot of stories like Irina Matvienka, Azizo Marava, Nazima Davletova. All these women are like creating so much noise. I went to Change Maker Festival in South Korea, which is or- co-organized by our Uzbek Canadian uh, illustrator Ksenia Tsoi, and another uh, Uzbek woman, woman who is a friend of mine. She's an architect. She's picked up a second degree of architect award, uh, Tahmina Turdaliva. And so I'm like, I'm hearing all these women making changes and making noise. And also, in, in I mean, from Finland to Moscow, we're having a lot of like f- um, empowerment through food. 
And so I see the changes like people are waking up and they're stand, speaking up for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, there are anonymous stories of what th that you can share with, uh, it's a hashtag, uh, don't be silent. So Nimal Chi mm. or, or uh, like speak up. I don't know, Karla Gash, if you have it also there. Uh, yes, we do. Yeah, mm -hmm. like in just last month in February, mm. I think I found 10 more Telegram channels and they're honest, they're raw in Russian, in Uzbek, where women activists are writing stuff. And I was like, great, this is cool. I couldn't do that 10 years ago. Mm. So I think in that sense, I just hope to avoid this, This, um, you know, the women are the new elite, which is the case now in Scandinavia. So ethnic women are told to be the new elite because they get the education they move out of their homes, so there isn't much social control. They pick up the best jobs, and then they are looked down by their community because it's still patriarchic if they come from non-Western backgrounds. And it aggravates men. So we need that education element in whatever we do so that it, the bubbles don't get bigger. Yeah, I wondered about uh, Bruce, your point on that. I mean, if you look into this region with your background as an American, yeah, there are lots of challenges and also some positive developments. Are we on the right track from your perspective? Well, in so much as they're raising a lot of these issues that, that people have tried to ignore for so long, I would say, yeah, um, but, you know, some progress, I suppose, a little bit. Mm. Uh, you know, certainly broad kidnapping in Kyrgyzstan, for instance, we had this, this horrible tragedy with Burulai a couple of years ago. And, and, you know, and this is again where all of a sudden you see that, that it is making some of a difference. People have spoken out about that. There are reports about, you know, when this does happen, that the police do actually go after these people. When, the, when they're reported, they go after them and, and arrest them. And I've seen this even in Kazakhstan, uh, you know, and they're, they're starting to portray this in the media as, as more of a shameful event. Uh, it's not the what it used to be where people just accepted it or uh, mm. some, I suppose, in rural communities or other places. They might have even thought this is just the way things, you do things. Carla Gosh mentioned that they changed the rape laws in yeah. Kazakhstan and made it much, much harsher. And they've actually, and I think all, well, I, I don't know about Turkmenistan, but in the other countries, they are starting to tighten the laws so that even if the relatives of these people show up and say, we will give you money for the wrong that our son what, or whoever has done to your daughter you know that, that that's not good enough the fact is they broke the law and that's yeah. you, you know whether well, the families are going to be able to get along together or come to some reconciliation that's that's outside the business but the fact is the law was broken somebody has to go and answer for this and if they were guilty then they have to be punished for that uh, it doesn't matter if you say i forgive you that's no good like i said on a personal level great but but that has to be an understanding that runs through society the whole time mm -hmm. violence is violence yeah. uh you know treating someone bad is treating someone bad and there's not two different ways to punish that kind of behavior. Whoever you do it to, you should expect that it's going to be punished. You should also expect that society is not going to accept this. Right. Yeah, also we need to wrap up the discussion very quickly here. Just the very last point, uh, Karli Gash. So given some changes, positive changes in Central Asia in terms of the women's right, what should be the future priority for activists like you, like Camilla, where their focus should be? Yes, I actually agree with Camilla when and she previously said that there must be more women in the government among decision makers because no matter what we do like we can be very active and very smart but if women are not among the decision makers the patriarchal society will not change because if all the decision makers are men they don't see it from a perspective of a woman on women's rights and re even reproductive rights everything so uh, can, I, um, can I interject something here I mean, in terms of the women's participation in the decision making which is really important very crucial mm -hmm. but we have been seeing women's participation on a highest level in Turkmenistan, but I'm not sure if it is really making a difference there. I mean, well, how how true is that participation? That's because what, yeah. if, if it's just a woman that was put there and has no say what in what she does and yeah. says, and so it should be a real participation, mm. like a real in, empowered women who should be among the decision makers. But how it um, should look like, Karligash? How you imagine that? Well, again, as a researcher here, mm. I would. But on my researcher hat, as a, we need to participate more probably in policy making because mm. when you make a like a public policy research and then you make recommendations, then you have some way to get into those like working groups and discuss the laws and maybe influence them in some way. So it should be not only activism, but it should be something that follows the 
formal rules. So right. we should penetrate it from different sides. Right. Camilla, what should be on the focus of women's rights activists going forward, given the, the achievements or the continued challenges from last year? Yeah, so I think the the guarantee of the freedom of speech mm. and uh, so that we, we come out from the, the, the fear of expression to there is, you know, um, managing social inequality is as big issue in Finland as much as in Uzbekistan and anywhere else in the world. I have studied in this uh, interesting futuristic lab in Finland looking at how do we remove these bubbles between young people in considering postcodes in, around Helsinki because it's also becoming a problem. And actually, I found out that in Uzbekistan, they have their own UNDP accelerator lab, which enables social experiments and different kind of experiments to promote this very agile policy making. because, you know, it takes years to put law into practice. And I think with this kind of different platforms where activists are involved, where NGOs are involved and, and also policymakers, which Karla Gash mentioned rightly, and the people in the business, you will have this multi-stakeholder approaches to say, mm-hmm. how do we elevate women? How do we promote human capital? Because all our nations are suffering from a huge brain drain. And if we don't you know, pick up the 50% nation, we'll never get there to 2030. SDGs will never get to the idea that I can actually go and retire in my home country and see my parents. And then you will have still one breadwinner male feeding 10 people and then having a heart attack dying at 40. You know what I mean? So it's 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 um, uh, right yeah. now it's we need a little bit of money, freedom and ambition to to experiment. And and so uh, I always say bring in the Uzbek dance to to pro- project gender equality. Lasgi, you know Lasgi, have mm. you danced it? <laughs> I am not, but I have seen it. I enjoy it, yeah. It's, it's one of the best beautiful dances that can compete with Bollywood dance. Mm. <laughs> but um, UNESCO has, has just added it um, last year to Immaterial Heritage. And when you look at that dance, it one cannot be performed without the other. We need man and a woman. Mm. And I find this is as a poetic and also artistic way to show why women can be as proactive, as productive, as efficient at work and at home. And that, you know, we, we shouldn't have that cultural pressure not to start our own company, but to actually go in and become also working, you, you know, ease the pain instead of, you know, our traditional way of looking at this, ourselves as daughter-in-law, sister-in-law, mm. a wife and a housewife. I think we're past that. And, and young people here, we, we really want to make sure that they also part of globalization because they are on the internet. They see everyone right. wants to live a fast life. Right. So I really hope that we will hear less stories of rape, but I don't think it's going to you know, go get less. Um, but it's mm. a good sign as the more things will be reported, mm. the more outrage it will create. And hopefully we, we will agree with Bruce next time that <laughs> progress to a larger extent than, than, you know, two steps ahead, one step back. Okay. I thought Bruce was very positive today. Bruce, with lots of these uh, changes and, of course, lots of challenges still remain to achieve the type of gender equality that one inspires to achieve in the region. So where your eyes will be going forward? I mean, what type of uh, priorities there should be to achieve the the goal? You know, I'll just be watching to see how much time they give to um, to women in, in the media. Hmm. Um, you know, not women from the media, but how much time the media actually focuses, how much space they give them to speak. Because I think, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about today is, you know, it all comes back to the, the deep-rooted traditions that hmm. no one challenges in public. And, hmm. and a lot of this stuff needs to be challenged in public, and you need to see and hear this. And it's better if it, people see and hear this from the women who it's, it's about them getting better better gender equality, equality in front of the law, things like that. And so I I would hope that there would be more female journalists writing stuff. I would hope there would be more female politicians on television and radio so that it kind of sinks in to people. You know, we're kind of in the early stages. Like I said, it's progress. But, you know, you're trying to redirect society into a direction that hasn't ever really gone before. Mm. Uh, But it needs to. Uh Bruce, can I pick up on that? Uh Uh-huh. I mean, media has an immense power to shape stereotypes and change stereotypes on, on how who, who gets to speak, right? And projecting women um, in books, in the media, in blogs, whatever, it's, it's really a big tool. So one of the things that I also had to say to you also, Muhammad, that in, in education, in study books, the gender, gender roles will be reconsidered. 
and Uzbek books, which I was like, finally, it's great. And even <laughs> I, when I studied Finnish, there was even a Finnish uh, language book, which also had stereotypes. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so nobody is perfect. And the gender streaming education is a big, big issue issue right now so the presidential schools in Uzbekistan they're they're also uh, looking at it to have a gender lenses in in their teaching because those are the latest schools they will produce the future leaders the elite and uh, the, it's a hard to get into the schools obviously so the idea of having female journalists is not a problem it's always the female journalists interviewing men we want to do the other way around <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and I'm tired of that. I want to have more women there. And we gotta have some some quotas. Like you cannot interview five men in a row. You gotta have someone there who looks different. Right. So just a final note from you, Carly Gash, and with that we will end the discussion here. So since you are the sexuality education activist, so mm-hmm. what do you see the, the type of change you hope to see Kazakhstan going through? From my perspective, I hope that parents become more open to this topic and actually parents don't mind sexuality education once you start talking about it to them and Mm. once you let them know that they have a say in it it's not like school would just start showing pornography to their children once they know that it's about their safety and safe sexual Mm. behavior and actually their health Mm. then they agree that they need it but nobody really explains it to them so I really hope that we will raise parents' awareness and other like more conservative mm. people's awareness about the essence of sexual and reproductive health. So that's what I would hope, because in my view, in the long run, sexual education leads to better gender equality, because boys and girls, they start seeing personalities of each other. They start seeing each other as human beings, not just bodies. Right. And that's my dream, actually, right. that we have that proper comprehensive sexuality education, not, not the abstinence-based sexuality right. education, which doesn't help at all. Right, to right, change right, problems. Right. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much, Karligash Kabatova Youth Sexuality Education Project, which is called Uyat MS. Uh, the project is, run, is out of Kazakhstan. And also big thanks goes to Kamila Sultanova, gender equality activist and entrepreneur at the Connect Uz. Uh, she's originally from Uzbekistan. And Bruce Panier, the editor of our Central Asia blog, Kishlog Awazi. Thank you, colleagues, for your time today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. And this is from me, Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis, ready for your pre-delivery Central Asia podcast. Until next week, bye-bye.